Good morning and happy Sabbath, saints of God. Good morning and happy Sabbath. We are here once again to worship God. We have been in his presence all week. Would you say amen? amen? And now it is the climax of the week. It is God's holy Sabbath day. So we want to extend a special welcome to those of you who are joining us here locally in Marietta, Georgia, and of course, our Save to Serve International family, wherever you may be in the United States or around the world, God is with you today. Because where two or three are gathered together in his name, there he is in the midst of them. So I want to extend that welcome to all of you today. And I want to let you know that God has some special blessings. Because in Psalm 23, David is praying to God and he says that when God's presence is there, his cup is going to run over. How many of you want those blessings so that they just run over and your soul is overjoyed? Amen. Well, God has that for you today. But there's a condition. Just keep your heart open. Keep a prayerful attitude and make sure you do not miss those blessings. Let's have a word of prayer as we begin our service. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us together today to be in your house, to worship with you in spirit and in truth. We ask that you would fill our hearts today with more love to thee, that we would see our need of Christ, that we would surrender, that we would give you all. And as we are here today, Many of your people are, are scattered. Some of us generally are at home live streaming the services and don't have this opportunity to congregate like this. So I just pray that we would be strengthened today, that we would make sure we pick up all the crumbs and store them, that nothing would be left to waste. Thank you, Lord, for what you will do. Bless all the presenters, all the speakers, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Now, friends, we are going to start with our service this morning. The song leaders are going to come up and worship God in song. And after that, we will hear none other than Sister Barbara O'Neill, who is going to bring to us the health message for this morning. Then after that, we will continue with our regular order of service and the sermon very soon. Be blessed. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Thank you for joining us here locally and also online. Um, are you ready to sing the mighty power of God? Amen. Let us turn to hymn number 88. I sing the mighty power of God. sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day, the moon shines full at his command. And all the stars obey. I sing the goodness of the Lord that filled the earth with food. He formed the creatures with his word and then pronounced them good. Lord, how thy wonders are displayed wherever I turn my eye. If I survey the tread or gaze upon the sky. There's not a plant or flower below but makes thy glories known, and clouds arise and tempests blow by order from thy throne. Creatures that borrow life from thee are subject to thy care. There's not a place where we can flee, but God is present there. Amen. Please stand at this time as we sing hymn number 272, 
Give me the Bible, hymn 272. gleaming to cheer the wanderer lone and tempest tossed no storm can hide that peaceful radiance beaming since jesus came to seek and save the lost give me the bible holy message shining thy light shall guide me in the narrow way Precepts and promise, law and love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible when my heart is broken, when sin and grief have filled my soul with fear. Give me the precious words by Jesus spoken, Hold up faith's lamp to show my Savior near. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combining. Till night shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible, all my steps enlighten. Teach me the danger of these realms below. That lamp of safety or the gloom shall brighten. That light alone the path of peace can show. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you. Heavenly music. I'd like to welcome you this morning where we're going to be looking at a very important subject. We're going to the most important part of the body, which is the capital city of the human body, headquarters, which is the inside workings of the human mind. Everything that happens in the mind affects the body and everything that happens in the body affects the mind. Such an important subject because this is the citadel where the God of heaven is to reign. And yet, wonder of wonders, he gave us the choice. <laughs> God is not, not a God of force, he is a gentleman. He never forces entry. So please bow your heads with me as we ask for him to teach us this morning. Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much for what you've done. May glory be to your holy name, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to show you exactly where it happens. I want to show you exactly in the brain where we communicate with the great God of heaven. 
So looking at the brain, we look at it from side on, and it looks a little bit like this, but looking at the brain from the top down, it looks a little bit like a walnut. Interesting to note that the walnut is very high in omega-3 fatty acid, which is a very important, important oil for the brain. Notice that there are two lobes at the front, and medicine calls these two lobes the prefrontal cortex. Pre meaning first, front, right at the front, and cortex refers to the whole top part of the brain. The prefrontal cortex takes up those two front pieces there, and it takes up approximately a third of the brain. The cortex takes up the whole top of the brain, and so the prefrontal cortex is right here at the front. And if you look at Revelation chapter 14, verse 1, the Bible says, And I looked, a lower lamb stood on the Mount Zion. Who's the lamb? In John chapter 1, verse 29, John the Baptist saw Jesus, and do you remember what he said? Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Praise God. I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Notice the Bible doesn't say on. It says in. It can never be on, because I could be held down, and by force, a mark could be put here. No, no, no. It's in. But what is in there? <laughs> what is in there is our brain. But right behind the forehead is the prefrontal cortex. And the function of the prefrontal cortex, this is where our intellect is. And isn't that what Jesus appeals to? Our intellect. My husband used to be a wild biker. And at the age of 21, God touched him. He said, people used to say to me all the time, Jesus loves you. He said, that meant nothing. It doesn't mean anything to me. Jesus loves me. He said, it had to make sense. My husband is a skeptic. I often quote his saying when people say, but look at my blood test. You know what he says? Oh, I don't believe that. <laughs> but Michael, look what the x-ray says. Oh, I don't believe that. Do you know, it's very good to have that have that benefit of doubt. Is that right? A lady said to me one day, my husband, he had, he had prostate problems. He was in surgery. They took a biopsy. And I used to work in operating theatre. I know what happens. They take the biopsy. It goes down to pathology. We wait. We wait for the result, and the result determines whether we take it or leave it. If it's malignant, the surgeons would take it. If it was benign, they'd just sew up. The test came back. This man was 57, malignant. They basically castrated him. Two weeks later, they found out it was the wrong test. Mm. It was actually the result of a 72-year-old man. Mm. Mm. Do you know, God, God gave us, it's our God-given right that I am the master of my destiny. God's government is a government of freedom. And what's freedom based on? Free choice. I choose. And no matter what the authority, when they say, this is what you should do, you know what your response is? Thank you so much for your advice. I'm going to seriously consider it. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to use my intellect. This is what gave us. He's, I'm going to use my reasoning powers. I'm going to use my judgment. And, de and determining on my intellect, my reason and my judgment, looking at the situation, I then make my decision. This is the way God made our brain. That we need to, we need to have a look at the situation before we make our decision. So because of what was happening in Australia, this is long before COVID, because the government brought in rules that you could not get your full family payment unless your child was vaccinated, my husband said, hey, that's wrong. That's against our constitution. One year later, the government said you can't put your children into childcare unless they're vaccinated. My husband said, someone's got to do something. 
Don't you love it when someone stands up and says someone's got to do something? Because evil prospers when? When good men do nothing. And he started a political party. It's called the Informed Medical Options Party. Information so that we can use our intellect, reason and judgment to make the decision. The best description I've ever read on the will I found in the little book Steps to Christ, one of my favourite books. On page 47 she says, what we need to understand is the true force of the will. This is the governing power in the nature of man. It is the power of decision or of choice. Everything depends. How much? Everything depends on the right action of the will. She says, you cannot change your heart. You cannot of yourself give to God its affections, but you can choose to serve him. You can give him your will. He will then work in you both to will and to do of his good's pleasure. Many don't understand that process, and yet it's pivotal. It's pivotal in understanding the way our brain works. But something else is coming in to muddy the water. But before I show you what that is, in, in Isaiah 1.18, God says, Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red, they'll be as wool. Notice what the Bible says, Jesus is saying, come let's reason. Where do we do that? Right here. This is where God communicates with man. This is where God wants to write his name. What's his name? Do you remember what Moses said? God, I beseech you, show me your glory. It's found in Exodus 33, 18. And God said, no man can see me and live. But he said, I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock and my backward parts will go before thee. Notice what Moses said, show me your glory. Let's have a look at these words. And then in Exodus 34, 5 and 6, the Bible says, And the Lord descended in a cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. What did Moses say? Show me your glory. And what's God going to show him? His name. Because his name is his glory. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious. What does God want to do? He wants to write this, Merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth-keeping, mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin, and God will in no wise pardon the guilty. Praise God for that, for people who've been abused. So badly treated, because what, God, what has God said? He said, judgment is mine, I will repay. And we know the Bible says that he's coming again. Amen. Praise be to God. Joy for those who've already surrendered their prefrontal cortex to God. Those who have surrendered their prefrontal cortex to God and day by day are allowing him to write merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands. Mercy's twice. It's a big one. That's what he wants to write. Will you let him? Because it's a choice. So what's muddying the waters? Let me show you. There's another system in the brain called the limbic system, and it's about here. And that limbic system is called the e-brain. E-brain meaning emotional brain. So here's our emotions, our thoughts, our feelings. And God designed the brain so that our thoughts, our emotions, our feelings, they thread through the prefrontal cortex. This is our board of sen senses. This is our board of critiques. Have you noticed? And sometimes those, those thoughts, those feelings, emotions, they'll go through and your brain will say, oh, don't, don't say that. Have you noticed? Praise God we think it before we say it, eh? Praise God we think it before we do it. Because right at that point, under the mighty power of God, we have the ability to say, no. I will not say that, and I will not do that. Mothers, what does God say? It's the most important role in the universe. 
And today in society, that's almost been forgotten. Is that right? But the, cra- the hand that rocks the cradle, what does it do? It rules the world. Hmm? It's a very, very important role. And yet, the little ones can often frustrate. <laughs> I, I often say, I rarely said what I felt like saying as a mother, <laughs> because it threads through. And what does God say? He says, ah, how do you want them to react? You see, this is where foresight is. And the prefrontal cortex is not fully developed until the age of 30. When did Jesus begin his ministry? When his prefrontal cortex was fully developed. My son Peter, he did something silly one day. He's 25. I said, Peter, what are you doing? He said, Mom, my prefrontal cortex isn't fully developed. (laughs) I said, yes, that's why you need your mother. (laughs) Don't build the brick walls between yourself and the teenagers and the children. There's a four-letter word. It's called time. Spend time with them. And do what James says to do in James chapter 1, verse 19. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God because of this limbic system. Mm -hmm. Let me show it how it works. This is your right. This is your right side, your right as you're looking. On the right side of the prefrontal cortex is the what I won't decision. On the left side of the prefrontal cortex is the I will. And right in the middle is I want. So I'm going to give you a scenario that I think we all experienced this morning. You wake up, and as soon as you wake up, oh, it's so nice and comfortable in bed. Mm -hmm. Our emotions say to us, I won't get up just yet, I will stay a little longer. But as prefrontal cortex really wakes up, you start to assess what's happening today. Ah, I've got a busy day. Mm. I've got this and this happening. Mm. I, need, I need to be sharp. I need to have all my faculties working well. I need to be sustained. And God has given us a formula that will sustain us. Psalm 55, verse 22, cast your burden upon the lawn and he shall sustain thee. He will never suffer the righteous to be moved. We need to be having daily sunshine. We need to get up and drink our water because our brain is a hydroelectric system. We need to go to bed early. If you don't go to bed early, you can't get up early. You'll miss your divine appointment. Your divine appointment is outlined in Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4. For the Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I may know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth my ear to hear as the learned. Such a beautiful time is that early morning where God can speak to us. Trust him. Right in the middle, we've got to trust. It's a choice. It's a choice. There are two polar opposites in the brain. One is faith and one is fear. And faith, in Hebrews 11, verse 1, it says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If you can see it, it's not faith. And God said in 2 Timothy 1, verse 7, he said, I have not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. What's a sound mind? Here it is. There's the sound mind. There's the mind that assesses. Never should we make a decision on fear. And I looked up the Greek for that word fear in that verse is timidity and cowardness. God says, I've not given you the spirit of timidity or cowardness. Mm. But he said, love, power, and a sound mind. A sound mind is a mind that allows the great God of heaven to live there. 
abstain. We must stop anything that is going to interfere with the communication system between us and heaven. And there's a great deceiver out there. And you know where he works? In the limbic system. That's where he works. He tempts us through our limbic system. And then as the temptations come and they thread through here, then we have given this to God. We've given this to God and we've got the heavenly counsellor, wonderful counsellor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9, 6. Here's our counsellor. Let him counsel you. And right then and there, you can stop those emotions taking control of your life. Abstain from anything that could interfere with that. Caffeine interferes. Refined sugar interferes with it. The hybridized weed of today even interferes with it. There's a book called Grain Brain by a neurologist named Dr. David Perlmutter. He shows the link between the hybridized weed of today and even mental illness. So does the book uh, Gut and Psychology by Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride. Tonight, I'm going to take you on a journey through your gastrointestinal tract and I'm going to show you the effect of that hybridized wheat. It's not the wheat God made. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that one. Inhale. Genesis 2 verse 7, and God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. He became a living soul. Where did he breathe them in? Nostrils. We breathe in and out through the area that God designed that we breathe through nose. <laughs> nutrition. Our brain cells need peak nutrition. And in Genesis 1, 26, God has defined it. Behold, I've given you every herb-bearing seed. There's your whole grains. There's your legumes or your beans, your nuts, your seeds. He said, to you it shall be for meat, the main substance. The grains, the legumes, the nuts and seeds, they're like the chicken's egg. In fact, it can be in a jar for 10 years and you put a bit of water and sunshine on what comes out of that hard seed. Life. There's life in that seed. It's the germinating principle. And when we eat that food we're eating, life. Moderation. Even the best food on the planet can be overdone. Exercise. Move that body. Move that body, which will increase blood to the brain. And when blood is increased to the brain, you've got more nutrition, you've got more oxygen, you've got more water. It's an amazing process. Cast your burden upon the Lord. He shall sustain thee. He will never suffer the righteous to be moved. Beautiful promise. And so when I'm doing this assessment of the morning, actually, I've got to start doing a few things. I've got to drink some water. I've got to get my hydroelectric system working. I've got to Come to God in prayer. The Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. 1 Peter 5 verse 6, humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due season. Your success in every enterprise in the day, whether it's washing dishes, washing clothes, tending the little ones or in an executive capacity, whatever you do through the day, your success is dependent on that early morning decision. We need to be prepared. We need to be prepared because we don't know what's going to be happening to us through that day. Am I right? We don't even know if this is the last day of our life. Is that true? Absolutely. And don't worry about that because the best is yet to come. Mm -hmm. My husband says, I don't know why Christians fear death. The best is coming. People say, Barbara, don't you worry about being on the plane? We're reading that many pilots are dropping dead because of the <clears throat> clot shot. Can't say the V word or the YouTube will take this down. Aren't you worried? I said, not at all. Not at all, because who holds my life? 
the great God of heaven, my one concern is, am I right with God? Mm, that's my one concern. I don't, I don't know when he'll take me. If it's tomorrow, I say, thank you, Father. But could it be just a little longer? I have a few children that I'm praying for, and I don't think anyone will pray for them like I do. Yeah. So it was probably, probably 18 years ago, God, God told me it, it was time for me to go. But I pleaded with him. I said, Father, Father, my children, my children, do you know what God said to me after a half an hour dialogue? Okay, I'll give you a bit longer. Oh, thank you, Father. <laughs> if it was me, I'd say, please, Father, take me. <laughs> take me. But oh, dear, what, what about? Ah, no, just a bit longer. What a beautiful illustration of how, as to why God hasn't come yet. Is that right? Oh, he's not ready. Oh, just a little longer. Just a little. Oh, what about this one? Who is this one? Is it you? Is it you? He wants you. There's a place in, your, in his heart for you. Mm. And so dialoguing with all this, here in my prefrontal cortex, because of what I want out of this day, I make a decision. I won't stay in bed any longer. I will get out of bed because of what I want out of this day. You see, our decisions determine our destiny. And God designed our brain that every decision we make is made according to intellect, reason and judgment. You see a lovely illustration of this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, starting at verse, uh, verse 23. For we wrestle not against... Well, it says the, warfare, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. What's not carnal? It's not flesh and blood. It's not, it's not guns. It's not, it's not spears and shields. It's not tanks. And what's the weapons now? A lot of the weapons, chemicals, yeah. No, verse, verse 24 says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. It's the prefrontal cortex that casts down imagination. It's the prefrontal cortex that brings into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The best science book we have is the Bible. The best neurology book is the Bible. You can't improve on the Bible. It is all there. So what takes this down? Uh, lack of sunshine. Do you know our eyes are an extension of our brain? Our brain needs sun. It gets it through our eyes. I don't suggest you look at the sun, but just being outside, those rays are going through. God planned it that way. Our brain's a hydroelectric system. Lack of water means a compromised prefrontal cortex. Lack of sleep, absolutely a compromised prefrontal cortex. Lack of trust in God. Did you know that faith goes, grows strong by earnest conflict with fear and doubt? When those doubts arise, what do you do? In one ear and out the other. Be on your way. I am not taking you into my body. Ellen White says in the book Ministry of Healing, in the chapter Mind Cure, she says, grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt, distrust, all break down the life forces and can even invite decay and death into the body. Let that grief go. Let that resentment go. Let it go. Let it go. So that we can have a strong prefrontal cortex. All the stimulants compromise prefrontal cortex. Breathing through the mouth, breathing out through the mouth, you're not getting enough oxygen into the cell. Nose purifies the air, nose pu humidifies the air, nose warms the air, nose balances blood gases, and nose pressurizes it. Perfect for lungs. And that great deceiver is deceiving so many. Nutrition, the fast food, 
the fast food, just grab that fast food. No, prefrontal cortex, before we lie down to bed at night, what am I going to have tomorrow? Do I need to soak my beans? Do I need to get this out of the freezer? See, prefrontal cortex? But that's compromised when you're not eating nourishing food. It's compromised when you overdo work, when you overdo food, when you overdo exercise. When we don't exercise, we actually inhibit the oxygen supply to our prefrontal cortex. Let's look at the first war, the first war that ever happened. It's found in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. The Bible says, and there was war in heaven, and Michael, his angels, fought against the dragon. Who's Michael? <coughs> Let's have a look at uh, Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 12, sorry, verse 1. And it says, and at that time shall Michael stand up. Praise be to God. That great prince that, that, that speaks, that fights, that stands up for the children of the people. And we know who the prince is. We know who that, that great prince is. We see it in Isaiah 6 verse 9. Unto us a son is born, unto us a child is given. And his name shall be wonderful counsellor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, prince of peace. There's the prince. So Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought with his angels and prevailed not. Praise be to God. Prevailed not. And then verse 9 says, And that great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which has deceived the whole world. Did you hear that? He's a liar. And that's what Jesus said about it in John chapter 8, verse 44. He said, Ye are of, the father of, the, ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of the father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. None. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. It's important to know the enemy. Amen. Or he can steal a march on you. Amen. It's important to know his deceptions. What's a deception? Not as it seems. If it was a right out lie, we would resist. But a deception mm, 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 doesn't hurt to go to bed a bit late. Oh, you don't need to drink that much water. You see that? Mm -mm. Oh, how successful he is. So when the Bible says he's deceived the whole world, that's everyone. And have a look at the next verse, verse 10. And it says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Now is come salvation and strength, the kingdom of our God, the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, that accuses them before our God day and night. Have you noticed? You're no good. You're an idiot. You'll never make it. Look what you've done. When he reminds you of your past, what do you remind him of? His future. Mm. Ellen White says in the little book, Steps to Christ, what to do with doubt. She said, when you hear that accusing voice coming to you, you're an idiot, you're no good, you've never been any good, you'll never make it. When you hear that voice, that's when you say, yes, and it was for the very likes of me that Jesus died. Because he is able. Have you seen what Jude 24 says? Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling is able, and to present you faultless. That's unbelievable. <laughs> it's believable because God said it, because he is able. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his Father's glory with exceeding joy. That's his joy. And that's why it says in... In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. What's his joy? You, on that sea of glass. You being presented faultless before his Father's glory. That's his joy. And it's possible. Not through me. It's possible through the great God of heaven. So how do we determine the voice of God and the voice of the devil? Let me show you. 
accuse all the accusations. You're no good. Look what you've done. You're an idiot. You'll never make it. Whose voice is that? That's not the voice of God. Let me show you the voice of God. It's in Matthew chapter 11, verse 21, 28. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, he says, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you will find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. That's the voice of God. Ephesians 3.20, now unto him who is able, here's another able, to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. And that power is the power of God. That's why in 1 Peter 5.7.6, the Bible says, humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God. That's Father, I want you. Father, I want to know you. Please come in. And in Revelation 3.20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And he says, If any man hear my voice and open the door, who opens the door? We do. He says, If any man hear my voice and open the door, have you seen what he says? He says, I'll come in. I'll come into your prefrontal cortex. He says, I will come in and sup with him and he with me beautiful illustration of the intimacy with which God wants to know you and me. He wants to sit down and sup with us. Beautiful. How do we open the door? Through our intellect, reason and judgment? That's how we open the door. We say, this makes sense. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of Power of love and a sound mind. A sound mind is a mind that is clear because the sustain me principles are implemented. That's our part. God could do no more than what he has already done. But remember there's a deceiver, a great deceiver, who says you don't need to drink that much water, you don't need to go to bed that early, You don't need to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. You don't need to stop your coffee as as if a little bit of coffee is going to hurt you. Can you see that deception? doesn't matter where you breathe in. They're a bit fanatical there. Nutrition, ah. Look at this guy. He's living on the fast food and he's all right. Let's have a look at him in another 10 years. Mm -hmm. He's not all right at all. It's a deception. You see, the first cigarette smoked doesn't cause lung cancer. The first cup of coffee drunk doesn't disrupt the neurotransmitters majorly. But like the dripping tap on a stone, what's happening? Little by little by little, that great deceiver is moving in. Because if he can compromise your prefrontal cortex, he can compromise your decisions because my decisions determine my destiny. Mm -hmm. If he can make you waver, that's where he is most successful. In the little book, Education, page 100, the Bible says, sorry, page (laughs) Education says, The same power that upholds nature is working also in man. The same great laws that guide like star and atom control human life. The laws that govern the action of the heart, regulating the current of flow to the body, are the laws of the mighty intelligence that has jurisdiction of the soul. From him all life proceeds. Only in harmony with him can be found its true sphere of action. To all objects of his creation, the conditions are the same. A life exercised in harmony with the creator's will, a life sustained by receiving life from the creator. Look at the last sentence. To transgress his law, whether it be physical, mental or moral, is to place oneself out of harmony with the universe, to invite discord, anarchy and ruin. Look at the three laws. Whether it be physical, here's physical law. Moral, we know the Ten Commandments. It's called the Great Moral Code of Ethics. Our constitution in Australia and America was based on the Ten Commandments. Absolutely. 
And, the, and many times, Revelation, it says, here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. They are the ones that are going to be on that sea of glass. They're the ones, the 144,000. We know the commandments of God are very important. But look at the third law, the mental loss. What are the mental loss? Let me take you through the mental loss. Because as this quote says, to transgress his law, whether it be physical, mental or moral, is to place oneself out of harmony with the universe, to invite discord, anarchy and ruin. The first law is, is Newton's third law of motion that states that to every action there is an equal and an opposite reaction. It's the law of cause and effect. And in Galatians 6 verse 7, the Bible says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that he shall also reap. But we shouldn't be too harsh because there's a great deceiver out there. And many people have been doing to their bodies dangerous things, things that are hurting them without even realising it. Isn't that incredible? That's how clever our enemy is. But before we go on, let's have a look at verse 11 in Revelation chapter 12. And they overcame him. Isn't that what we want to hear? Amen. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. His blood is my argument. <laughs> yeah, my past is filthy. My past is bad. Oh, I love the story of Mary. What did Jesus say? She loves much because she's been forgiven much. Yes, the past is bad, but they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. That is our most powerful argument. The blood of Jesus Christ says, 1 John chapter 1, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Got that? No exception. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all our sins. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. And it doesn't end there. Cleanse us from all righteousness by the blood of the Lamb. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. For they loved not their life unto death. No one can argue about your testimony. I never used to drink water. I used to have two or three glasses a day. I used to always get headaches, always. Every time I travelled, headaches, terrible sinus. Then I discovered you've got to drink water. How do I drink water? I just can't drink a whole glass. And then I thought, you know, I can, I can drink little bits. <laughs> and I found that you can drink little bits all through the day and easily get your eight glasses. Praise be to God, no more headaches. Even with my hang gliding accident when I was 21 and did something funny to my spine, even then, praise be to God, no headaches. No sinus anymore. That's my testimony. And no one can argue against that. As you implement these, you'll have a testimony. And that's a powerful testimony. Proverbs 26 verse 2, the Bible says, The curse causeless shall not come. No problem happens without a cause. And how often is the effect blamed as the cause? One lady said, Barbara, I've just found all my problems. The cause of it, I've got chronic fatigue syndrome. That's not the cause. That's the effect. That's the effect. Never should be the effect be blamed as the cause. So what's the cause? It's real easy. Lack of oxygen at the cellular level. But there can be a hundred reasons why the lack of oxygen at the cellular level. See, when we're breathing through our nose, getting that pure oxygen, so the oxygen is being purified and we're breathing out through our nose, which balances the blood gases, every cell will receive 18 times more energy. Whoa! What an incredible process. Don't you love God's true remedies? That's what these are. How much do they cost? Hmm? They're within reach of everyone, the king and the pauper. The head physician to the royal family in Dubai rang me up once and said, the royal family's been watching your lectures. <laughs> We'd like you to come to Dubai and teach. And I said, well, I'm happy to do that, but I'm a little bit busy this year. 
And when I got off the phone, Michael said, Barbara, <laughs> we would have adjusted. God is no respecter of persons, is that right? Yes. I'm, I'm not going to sacrifice <laughs> the one that has no money for the one that has a lot of money. And you look, at, you look at Jesus' life. He spent the same amount of time with everyone. The woman at the well. That one leper. Yeah. And even look at Pilate. He even gave him glimpses. Isn't that right? He said, for this end I was born, for this cause I came into the world. This is what he said to Pilate when Pilate said, art thou a king then? To this end I was born, for this cause I came into the world that I might bear witness of the truth. He gave Pilate a glimpse. He was, he was pleading with his soul. Is that right? None is lost to him. So the saddest thing is that many people are doing to their bodies things that are damaging their body and not realising it. That's why education is power. Page 127 of the Ministry of Healing, Ellen White says, the only hope of better things is the education of people in the right principles. Let the physicians teach the people that restorative power is not in drugs, but in nature. <laughs> Here it is, in nature. What about depression? What's the cause of depression? Because it's, it's, it's not a cause. And how often have people said that? I've just found the cause of all my problems. I've got depression and I've had depression for years. <laughs> I can understand why they say that because they've been told that. Remember what my husband says? I don't believe that. I don't believe that. My husband just amazes me with his first wife. We've been married 25 years. His second wife was in labour and they said, oh, excuse me, Mr O'Neill, but her, the baby's blood uh, pressures, not the pulse has dropped. We'll need to do a caesarean. Michael said, I don't believe that. <laughs> the doctor said, excuse me, Mr O'Neill, you could lose your wife and your daughter. Michael's 21. He said, no, I know God made babies to come out that way. Nah, you're not doing a Caesar on her. <laughs> Guess what? Baby came out. <laughs> Do you know, they could be wrong. That's why God requires you to be your doctor. Yeah? Only you know what you've been through. Only you know how different things react or respond on you. Mm-hmm. And if a mother has a sick child and she's worried, by all means, go to the doctor. <laughs> Have an assessment. And when he gives you the script, say, thank you so much for your advice. And then go home and look at Barbara O'Neill's poultices. And, <laughs> and you know, as the baby responds, what's the baby's body telling that mother? Yeah, that response is telling you we can do this. And I've done that as a young mother, when I was a young mother, many times. I had the script in my bag. But I tried the natural remedies and the child responded, so I never had to do the script. So what's the causes of depression? Dr Neil Nedley, who's done a lot of work in this field, he's even written a book called Depression A Way Out, he said that, there, he said that genetics cannot cause depression. Isn't that good news? Genetics loads the gun, but it is lifestyle that pulls the trigger. Here's the lifestyle. Even if both our parents committed suicide, we need never go there. And how many go there because they think they're going to go there? Where's the think? Up here. This is the devil. Remember, he's the one that wants to devour you. 1 Peter 5, 6... Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. He will exalt you in due season. Cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, knowing that your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, did you hear that? Yeah. He's walking around seeing whom he can devour. And then the Bible says, whom? Resist, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same... Afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. We say in Australia, we're on the same boat. Is that right? Yes. That's why God gave us each other. 
And remember, what's your first character trait written on your, in your forehead? Mercy. 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 So, no, genetics cannot cause depression. What about lifestyle tragedy? Every heart has its sorrow. Every heart has had its sorrow. It's not what happens to us. It's what we do with it. Yeah? It's what we do with it. And the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks. So when I was in Dubai, I was there for one night flying at the uh, beginning of June. May, sorry, beginning of May. Flying from Dubai to Germany. I had a month there at a school. I woke up early in the morning because, you know, there's an enemy out there. I woke up early in the morning. I quickly went and turned the phone off. I don't like the electromagnetic fields near me. <laughs> As I turned around to come back, it's in the dark. My heel hit my suitcase and I went back. <laughs> you know, when you go back, you can't stop yourself. I took a mighty blow in the back of my head and between my shoulder blades stood up, the whole room is turning, I laid down and as I laid there, you know what I said? Thank you, Father. <laughs> oh, I was in a lot of pain. Thank you, Father. Do you know what thanking him does? It unties his hands. And if you think you got it tough, read the last night of Jesus' life. Read the last hours of his life. And remember, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is upon him. With his stripes, we are healed. His blood, he went through that for you and me. So I lie there saying, thank you, Father. But I've got, got to catch that plane. And ah, oh, the whole room is spinning. But I, I know I had to thank God. Father, I prayed. What will I do? Cold shower. Wonderful tonic. Had a cold shower, it was cold. It revived me. <laughs> I packed my suitcases and I'm in, we call it La La Land. <laughs> you know, when you're in the front line of the battle, there's going to be some wounds, is that right? But you know, God says in 1 Corinthians 3, 13, there hath no, take, no temptation taken you, but that which is common to man but God is faithful and he will not tempt you above what ye are able and with the temptation he'll make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Praise be to God. Hmm? Praise be to God. If I had to have a mighty blow, that was a good one because I could still function. <laughs> I got on the plane, oops, I couldn't put my head back. And that afternoon, I put my hand on the back of my head. Whoa, there was a mighty lump there. But praise be to God. Uh, obviously, the brain survived. <laughs> do you know, stuff happens, is that right? Yeah. But do you know what God wants to say? Thank you, Father. I don't understand this. I know that I'm in the battle, and I know that there's an enemy out there. But thank you I didn't break a leg, because then I wouldn't have been able to catch the plane. And in Dubai, where am I going to go and get a leg? So, so, so thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. In Desire of Ages, it says that he walked the pathway. And if you look in the footsteps, there's thorns. He's crushed the thorns down to make it easier for us. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. So it's not what happens to you, it's what you do with it. So what do you do in the case of severe abuse? Even sexual abuse at the hand of a father, isn't that the worst case of betrayal? I was talking to a very angry young woman. The elder of the church had touched her. Yeah. There's a great deceiver out there and he wants to turn you away from our loving father. Yeah. The second law, mental law, is the law of choice. And the law of choice states that forgiveness is a choice. And Peter said to Jesus, how often should we forgive? Seven times? He thought he was being pretty generous, didn't he? 
What did Jesus say 70 times 7? You never stop. Now what most people don't understand, it's a prefrontal cortex decision. It's not determined by our feelings because if it was determined by our feelings, we would never do it. Just do it. And I have seen many people freed from depression by forgiving their abusers. So the Bible says, in everything give thanks. How can you be thankful for that? doesn't mean you like it, and it doesn't mean it's right. When you say thank you, you're saying, Father, I don't like it. I don't like what happened. But I'm going to thank you. Because I know that out of this, you can make things happen that maybe never would have happened if I had not been like that or through that. And for those who've been abused, there's a beautiful verse. It's found in Luke chapter 17, verse 1, where Jesus says it's impossible, but these offences will come. They're an offence. It's impossible that they will come. Why is it impossible? Because... God gave mankind choice. And because he gave mankind choice, some men, some women would choose wrong and the innocent people suffer. It's the nature of the beast. It's impossible, but these offences will come, but woe to him by whom they come. It will be better that a millstone were hung around his neck and him thrown into the deepest sea than him touch one of my little ones and you're one of his little ones. Because he that touches you touches the apple of my eye, says God. Mm -hmm. A judgment day is coming. God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay and he'll do a better job. Leave it with him. Our role is to forgive. And if you don't feel like it, that's perfectly fine because how could you possibly feel like it? But once you do it, the next law kicks in and that law states that our words affect our feelings. Just do it because you will begin to feel better about it as time goes on. Just do it. It's like the young girl that said, all right, I'll forgive. Mm. She's only 14. She'd been sexually abused by her father. Mm. She's angry. She's bitter. And I knew that her whole life would be affected if she did not make this decision. All right, I forgive. That afternoon she said, I'm feeling better about it. I said, you are experiencing a law of the mind and that law states that our words affect our feelings. The next day she said, I don't feel like it today. Remember, 14, prefrontal cortex, only half developed. I said, no wonder you don't feel like it because this has happened and it's a trigger to tell you that this happened because of this, but you'll get over it. What did I do when I said you'll get over it? Let me show you. Here's our nerve cell. And our nerve cells, there are one trillion of them in our brain. You've heard of white matter and grey matter? Well, the grey matter is the inside of the cell. The white matter is the fatty substance around it. It's the fattiest organ in the body. That's why the fat-free diet is a very dangerous diet for brains. I don't suggest drinking a cup of olive oil a day. (laughs) Just a little bit. I'm sure that's all God put in the widow's cruise when she was feeding Elijah. Yeah? Just a little bit. And when God put that oil in that cruise, what did God say about olive oil? It's good. It's good. And I'm sure it was the best oil. So when this girl, who was bitter and angry about what had happened to her, she'd developed a strong pathway, grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse. You know what had also happened in her bitterness? Thorns had grown between the dendrites. Dr. Carolyn Leaf, a Christian psychoanalyst, she shows this, that when we entertain negativity, thorns grow between the dendrites. There's your psychosomatic diseases. That's what feeds the resentment. So when she said, all right, I forgive, what's still the strongest pathway? is the resentment pathway. But every day when she confirms the fact that she's forgiven, that pathway gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And refusing, because we have a choice, refusing to go down the old pathway 
the old pathway gets thinner and thinner. How long does it take before we've got a new pathway? 21 days. But it takes about 60 for it to be in cement. And you'll find that when you're learning a new instrument, when you're learning a new Bible verse, when you're learning a new language, it takes about 60 days before it's in cement. But by 21 days, you've got a strong pathway. Science shows us that we can be rewiring our brain right up until the day we die. Praise be to God. And what did God say in Ezekiel 36, 26? He says, I'll take away your heart of stone. I'll give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. You should keep my judgments and do them. Superhuman help. Right here in the prefrontal cortex. So if lifestyle tragedy cannot cause depression and if genetics cannot cause depression, what causes depression? Well, Dr. Neil Nedley calls them hits. He said a bit of genetics, a bit of lifestyle, uh, lack of sunshine, dehydration, lack of sleep, anxiety, too many stimulants, there's a whole lot there, breathing through the mouth, <laughs> impoverished diet, overdoing work, overdoing the wrong things, lack of exercise, and that can tip the scales. So when someone comes for help with depression, you know what's the first thing we do? We implement the sustain me principles. <laughs> we, we get them to spend time in the sunshine. Did you know those rays go through neurochemical pathways, hit serotonin, and that's your mood hormone just from being outside in the sun. Going to bed early, drinking more water, starting to read the Bible. In Job 22, verse 21, the Bible says, Acquaint now thyself with him. Get acquainted. Get acquainted with the Saviour. Thereby good shall come unto thee, and receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth, and lay up his words in thine heart. Then shall thou lay up gold as dust, and the gold of offal as the stones of the brook. Yea, the Almighty shall be thy defence, and thou shalt have plenty of silver. That's true wealth. Acquainting ourselves with the Saviour. Get to know him. Start laying up the words in the mind. Stop the stimulants. Start easing off them. If they stop, they'll really be depressed. <laughs> Ease off them, little by little by little. Start breathing through the nose. Get more oxygen into the brain. Then every brain cell has 18 times more energy. Start eating a plant-based diet, whole foods. Be moderate in the things you do. Implement an exercise program. And we have seen many conquer depression by just starting that. And then once they're implemented, then we put our detective hat on and find out, now where did it start? Oh dear, this happened. Oh, and that. A man told me this story. He said, this lady was a friend of mine. Her father was driving the tractor and the children were on the back and the little three-year-old fell off and the, went under the wheel. The little three-year-old died. He said a few weeks later, her eldest son was driving a motorbike and was in a serious crash and became a paraplegic. Six months later, her husband came out of their driveway on his motorbike and the car didn't see him and he was killed. And when the police came up to that lady to tell her that her husband had just been killed, you know what the first thing she said was? I don't want the driver of the car charged. Is that forgiveness? <laughs> is that forgiveness? Because that poor driver is going to have to live with that for the rest of his life. Is that right? He needs the saving grace of Jesus. Forgive. 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 Forgiveness has an incredible effect to detoxify our brain, as I'll show you. Forgiveness is a choice and love is a choice. Love is not an emotion, it's not a feeling, it's a principle. God gives us the opportunity to know him and to love him. And when you choose to love, the choice happens here. And to choose to love should be made according to intellect, reason and judgment. And so 26 years ago, my, my now husband Michael decided he needed a wife. 
he'd been single for a few years, he decided he needed a wife. And he decided, because he's a businessman, that if he works it out on paper, it'll work. Because in business, if it works out on paper, it works. So he made a list of all the women that he knew that were at all eligible. He was 39 at the time. And he had a list of pros, or fors and against, pros and cons. <laughs> I'd known Michael for 10 years. I was a single woman. And unbeknownst to me, my name went on the list. <laughs> His friend said, Gary, take one of the young therapists. He said, no, don't work out on paper. Doesn't work out on paper. <laughs> and so apparently my name kept going to the top of the list, but I had two negatives. One was I had too many children. Who's going to take on six children? But when he got to know them, they weren't brats. He said he couldn't have handled brats. But the children were well behaved and they were hard workers and he thought, oh, good, that's an asset. So that negative went and the other negative was that I was older than him by three and a half years and he said he would never have considered anyone older than him. And so I came to the top of the list. So I get a knock on my door. He said, Barbara, I've got a few things to talk to you. <laughs> He was a business manager of Living Valley Springs. My daughters worked there and I worked part-time. I said, yes. He said, I've been thinking about things and I reckon you and I should get married. <laughs> Just like that. I said, this is very analytical. He said, I'm a he said, I'm a very analytical man. I said, well, I think when two people marry, they should love each other. And when I said that, I, I knew I threw him. And he thought a minute and he said, well, <clears throat> I'm very attracted to you and I love your character. And when he said that, I thought, really? I'm very attracted to Michael O'Neill and I love his character. He's a mover and shaker. I like that. So I looked at him and said, all right, I will. <laughs> and it seems like a flippant answer to a life-changing question. But we'd known each other for 10 years. We'd met at homeschool camps. We'd both been single for a few years. He said, great, meet me tonight at my house with all the kids. <laughs> <laughs> Here are the kids. Mine 10, he's 11, mine 12, he's 13, mine 14, mine 16, mine 19, mine 21. So they all sat in a half circle and he says, well, children, we have an announcement to make. <laughs> and his daughter said, dad, we already know. He said, right. So he asked every child what they thought and every child agreed and I thought that was the first miracle. Because <laughs> I'd been a single mother for a few years and my little boys would stand in front of me saying, get away from my mother. <laughs> <laughs> and I think Michael showed great respect to my children by not touching me, by not coming near me until the decision had been made. Because love is a principle. And I said yes because I very much admire this man. <laughs> I used to watch how he worked. I loved his crazy sense of humour. <laughs> and so when he was asking me to marry him, I thought, how can I improve on this? <laughs> and the fact that he was attracted to me and loved my character, I thought, that, now, isn't that the ingredients? <laughs> They're the ingredients we need. What's interesting was 24 hours later, he walked past my window and my heart began to beat and I thought, that's right, I'm, I'm marrying him. It's, it's, it's all right. <laughs> so I didn't have to bring any feelings back. And how often do people let feelings go where they should never go? It wasn't long before I was very much in love with my husband and I still am today very much in love with my husband. And people say to him, what would you have done if she said no? He said, oh, I'll go to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> That's my husband. <laughs> I've been married to Michael for it's almost 26 years and he has never raised his voice to me. He has never got angry. I think I'm married to the strongest man on the planet. <laughs> and I taught my boys a proverb at a very young age. It's found in Proverbs 16.32, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. Yes. And that's what I wanted my boys to be. And I'm so thankful that my husband, Michael, has showed them an illustration of that. Forgiveness is a choice and love is a choice. 
and I believe they are both not negotiable, that, that they must just happen whether you feel like it or not. And you'll find that love and forgiveness are like strong arms, lines in your life, and sometimes your feelings will go up and down, but it doesn't change the fact that you have. Your words affect your feelings, so be very careful on your words. The Bible says that in Proverbs 13, verse 3, that he that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life, but he that openeth wide his mouth shall have destruction. And that brings us to the fourth law, which is similar, but actually totally different to the third one, which is that your words reveal your feelings and you can't let them all out. Proverbs 29, 11 says, the fool utters all his mind. Who does? The fool. But the wise man keeps it in till afterwards. There are things that need to be said, but they need to be said when the emotions are under the control of the prefrontal cortex and the prefrontal cortex is under the control of God. Colossians 4 verse 6 says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer every man. And number five is the law of adaptation. We have a changeable brain. Did you know that science didn't always acknowledge this? It's only 15 years they've acknowledged we have a changeable brain. It's called neuroplasticity. Proverbs talks about it. In Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed. And Proverbs 22, 24, make no friendship with an angry man. And with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare for thy soul because of the law of adaptation. And because we have a changeable brain, our brain can grow and our brain can shrink. Last night I shared a statement from the book uh, Christ Objects Lesson, page 347. The physical organism needs to be carefully preserved and developed, that through humanity the divine nature might be revealed in all of its fullness. Do you know that physical organism can, includes our brain? We should constantly be learning new things. But if we entertain or cherish negativity, we can cause thorns to grow between the dendrites and they can damage the tissues. But the wonderful growing scenario is we can learn new things right up until the day we die. And every time we learn a new thing, it causes new dendrites to grow. And that one nerve cell can develop 70,000 dendrites. Oh, the tragedy that most people go through their life never fully accessing the full potential of their brain. Yes, this is a treasure. It's a treasure that we need to guard and protect. Also, we can be rewiring the brain till the day we die. So the three things that cause the most powerful growth of dendrites is learning a new instrument, Learning a musical language, I mean, a new language. <laughs> I'm told that learning music is like learning a new language. And the third one is memorising the Bible. In page 90 in the book Steps to Christ, it says there is nothing more potent to, inter to, to boost the intellect than the study of the scriptures. There is no other book so potent to elevate the thoughts, vitalize the faculties than the broad ennobling truths of the Bible. If God's word were studied as it should be, men would have a breadth of mind, a nobility of character and a stability of purpose rarely seen today. Start today. It takes me a week to learn one verse. You might be quicker. What's the terrible shrinking scenario. If you don't use your brain cells, you will lose them. I don't want to lose my brain cells. What's the wonderful shrinking scenario? When we forgive everyone who's ever hurt us in our life, it stimulates glial cells while we sleep to come along and vacuum clean up the thorns in our brain. The, gly the glymphatic system is made up of glial cells in the brain. It's the vacuum cleaning system but it's only active in the early powers of the hours of the night. Got that? So we need to be going to bed at 
no later than 10, ideally between 9 and 10, when we forgive, when we ask Father in heaven, give me the ability to forgive my abuser. Remember what the man prayed? Lord, help me my unbelief. <laughs> Lord, help me my inability to forgive. And every day you'll find that you can, you can, you can. Remember unto him who is able. You can. And when you forgive and you lay down to sleep, let's say we all forgive everyone right now who's ever hurt us in our life. Tonight when we go to bed between 9 and 10 at the latest, the glial cells come along and vacuum clean up all the thorns. So forgiveness has an effect to cleanse the brain from those thorns that build up when we entertain or cherish negativity. What an incredible brain we have. The last law, the last mental law, is the law of diversion. And the law of diversion states that when something is so firmly denied as to refuse any hope for it, the brain has the ability to divert to other pursuits. So I'm going to end with a little story that'll, that'll show this. I don't know whether that's a T or an S. S, sorry. If there's any teachers in the, work, in the room, they'll be very taken back at my lack of spelling. I'm learning. So this lady that came to our retreat, I said, how many children do you have? She says, two, no one. I said, oh. She said, my 25-year-old son was killed in a motorbike accident 18 months ago, but we don't talk about it. I said, if you need to, you can come and talk. She just frowned. All week she was frowning with her head down. And then I gave a lecture on forgiveness. And I showed how forgiveness cuts the chains that bind us to painful past. It gives us wings. It gives us healing. Forgiveness is the only prescription in the entire universe that has the power to break the chemical bonds of hostility, anger and hate. Upon hearing these things, she made a decision to forgive. And I saw her the next day. She was smiling. First time I'd seen her smile. I said, what's happened? She said, I realised I had to give, forgive my son for driving so fast. Only the great God of heaven can show us where the forgiveness needs to go. She said, he used to drive so fast. I'd, put my, I'd say to him, Stop driving so much fast, you'll kill yourself. And he'd put his arm around me and said, Mom, I'm not going to die. She said he was my boy. Sometimes that can be the hardest thing when someone is taken from us too young, too soon. She said, I now realise I have to forgive him for driving so fast. She said, I'm going to go home and I'm going to contact my daughter. Because she was so bitter and angry, the law of adaptation, her daughter was reacting the same way and when they got together, sparks flew. She said, I'm going to go and show my daughter what I've learned. And she said, I want to do a course so that I can help other mothers who've lost their sons. Wow, I saw this whole lady's life just turn around. And you know, one of the best things we can do for illnesses is find someone else to help. Yeah. Jesus said he became a servant, and that's what we are. To transgress his law, whether it be physical or mental or moral, is to place oneself out of harmony with the universe, to invite discord, anarchy, and ruin. Adhering to the laws, physical, mental, moral, when we adhere to them, then we have harmony, we have peace and we have a healing mind. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for what you've taught us. May your will be done in our lives, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Amen. What a powerful presentation. Let us continue with our song service at this time and open your hymnals to hymn number 86, How Great Thou Art. How fitting is that?
Let us praise him, praise him, hymn number 249. Sabbath once again. Were you blessed this morning? Yes. What a blessing. Amen. We're going to go now into a short season of prayer, but I want to share a couple of thoughts with you this morning. How many of us were here last night? Raise your hand if you were, were you here last night. You know, there was, a, uh, there was a point that Sister Barbara O'Neill that, you know, may reminiscent in my mind, and, and that is the importance of keeping our brains active, right? And she talks a lot about that this morning. Now, why is this thing crucial and important for us to keep our minds active? Why is that? We do not want our minds to be empty because if our minds are empty, the enemy is going to take advantage of that and then he's going to come and possess our minds. I'm going to show you Bible for that. If you, if you look at the, at the Bible in the book of Matthew chapter 12, there was a man in there who was set free of, of demon possession. 
yet because his mind, his, his, his body temple, the Bible says, uh, it was empty, swept, and garnished. Do you see that? And that's the reason why we need to keep our minds filled with God's Word. You know, Sister Barbara mentioned three things that we need to do in order to keep our minds sharp and keen. She mentioned them this morning, and she mentioned them last night. What are those three things? Learn a new language, right? Learn how to play uh, an instrument. And I believe the most important one is memorizing Scripture. I think that if we practice that, we're going to be in really good shape. Look at verse 43. It says, When the unclean spirit is gone out out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. And what does the spirit does? The evil spirit said, you know what? Let me go back where I came from. Let me go to my house. Think about it. He was uh, so confident that that body temple belonged to him, that he went back. And look at what it says in verse 44. Then he said, I will return into mine house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he find it, it empty, swept, and garnished. We don't want that. We need to have God's word in the mind. Look at verse uh, 46. And this is, this is really... Um, What's the word? Awful. Because it says, Then goeth he, and take it with himself, seven other spirits, complete demon possession. And it says, Wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto these wicked generations. Brothers and sisters, we don't want that. <laughs> we need to start practicing what Sister Barbara has shared with us. And that is start putting the scriptures in your mind. You know, there is a statement um, in, in the spirit of prophecy that says, build a wall. See that? Build a wall. What are we going to build a wall off of? What? Made out of what? Made out of his scriptures. So it says here, build a wall of his scriptures around you. And you will see that the world cannot break it down. And then he says, commit the scripture to memory. Why? So that when the enemy comes with the temptations, when he says you're not good, <laughs> you're an idiot, then we can reply back, it is what? It is written. He says, commit the scriptures to memory. And then throw them right back upon Satan. When he comes with his temptations... It is written, this is the way our Lord met the temptations of Satan and resisted them. Amen. Do you see that? She also mentions about our brain being a treasure house. It says here in another statement, let them keep the treasure house of mind and heart well filled with it is written. And this is the most beautiful one that I like. It says, hang in memory hall, the precious words of Christ, they are to be value far above silver or gold. Do you see that? So what are the words of Christ more value of, more valuable than silver and gold? Brothers and sisters, let us remember these words. And with these words in mind, I encourage you to, uh, to always study, to try your best to... to to do what God is asking us to do. We can make this very practical. Even Sister White says that we need to keep a pocket Bible in with us. That when we have a little bit of free time, what are we to do? To pull our pocket Bible and start committing memory, you know, a, a text to memory, right? So that we can strengthen our minds, so that we can learn, so that we can keep our minds sharp and keen, right? All right, with these words in mind, I invite you to please kneel with me, and we're going to spend a few moments in prayer that the enemy will not find our minds empty, swept, and garnished, but that they will be filled with God's word. Amen? Let us spend a few moments in prayer.
us pray. I will give you about a minute or two to bring your petitions before the Lord and ask God that at this moment our minds will not be empty, swept and garnished, but that they will be filled with his word. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, which are in heaven, this morning we come in the mighty name of Jesus, giving you thanks and glory for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon each one of us. We thank you for the gospel medical evangelism week that we have gone through. We have received wonderful information. But the question is, what are we going to do with it? So, Father, we're asking that you will please help us to implement what we have heard. Let it not simply be words that we hear that come in one ear and come out the next, and that we continue in our same condition. Some of us are sick, and we understand, Lord, that if we applied the sustain me principles, we can be restored. Father, forgive us for our sins. It is the Sabbath. We come claiming your promises. If we confess he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. We are here, Father. Your people have gathered together. We need you on bending knees. We are showing you, Father, that we need you more than ever before. It is the year 2023. Please help us. Father, God told Ezekiel, you told Ezekiel, fill thy vows with this road that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey, for sweetness. So, Father, help us. Do not let anyone about us be found in the condition of the man that was set free from demon possession. Because when that demon came, he came with other seven and took full control of this man's life simply because his body temple was empty, swept, and garnished. Father, we pray that morning by morning we will come before you and seek your face and fill our minds with your word. The Bible says, how sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. So, Father, help us. Give us the strength to do what you have called us to do, and that is to fill our mind, our brains, our hearts with your word. You said, thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. And that is one of the reasons that we want to put your word in our minds so that we will not cause you any more pain. Joseph said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God. The first thought that came to his mind when he was tempted to commit sin, he thought of you. So help us, O oh Father, that our first thought when the enemy comes with his, his temptations will be, how can we do this great weakness against thee? Father, we want more blessings from you today. So I pray, Lord, that all of us will be attentive we pray for Pastor Andrew Henriquez as he will come here shortly to bring your word. Help us, O oh Father. You said, man shall not live by bread alone, 
but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So, Father, help us as we partake of this bread. Help us. Thank you for all that you do. Father, I pray, Lord, if there is anyone here who is going through difficulties, whatever maladies or sickness, illness, I pray, Lord, that you will please be with them, that the information that they have heard throughout all this week, they will take home, implement, and by your grace and power, the healing will come. Once again, bless us, hasten the footsteps of those who are not here, and continue to be with us. We give you all the honor and praise to your name. All these things we ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Sweet Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove, stay. This time, Sister Esther will sing us a special music, and I hope that you will be blessed. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Today I will be singing a song called Someone is Praying for You, just as an encouragement for all of you out there who may be struggling with um, different things health-wise, um, mental health-wise. And this is just a, it's just something that will help to encourage you along your uh, Christian path. Someone is praying. He cares and he 
knows just how much you can bear. He'll speak your name to someone in prayer. Someone is praying for you. Someone is praying for you. Amen. Praise God for those words. Someone is praying for us, and that someone is Jesus Christ himself. Praise the Lord. Today is a high Sabbath, brethren. Today we are remembering our Lord Jesus Christ. It is the Lord's day. And we want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. How many of you want to hear those words? Anybody here? And notice what Jesus tells us here in Luke 16, he tells us in verse 10, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. So we need to be faithful in the great things. Not just the great things, brethren, but also what? The little things. The little things. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? What a word. The Lord is reminding us that we are only stewards, that we are not only borrowing money but also we're living on borrowed time everything that we have is given to us by jesus and we are his stewards are we being faithful brethren in what he has entrusted to us he he continues he says and if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's who shall give you that which is your own How can we ever receive the inheritance that Jesus has for us if we don't know how to be faithful in what we have now? If we are not being faithful now, brethren. So what does Jesus say? He says, you can't can't have two masters. You can't serve me and money. We have to choose, brethren. Isn't that what we were talking about today? The power of the mind to choose Choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, what will we do? We will serve the Lord as the deacons get ready to collect the tithes and the offering. Let us turn to hymn number 531, We'll Build on the Rock. We'll build on the rock, the living rock, on Jesus, the rock of ages. So shall we abide the fearful shock when loud the tempest rages. We'll 
will build on the rock, on the solid rock. We'll build on the rock, on the solid rock. We'll build on the rock, on the solid rock. On Christ, the mighty rock. Some build on the sinking sands of life, on visions of earthly treasures. Some build on the waves of sin and strife, for fame and worldly pleasures. We'll build on the rock, on the solid rock. We'll build on the rock. The solid rock. We'll build on the rock, on the solid rock, on Christ the mighty rock. Oh, build on the rock forever sure, the firm and the true foundation. His hope is the hope which shall endure. The hope of our salvation. We'll build on the rock. We'll build on the rock. We'll build on the rock, on the solid rock. On Christ, the mighty rock. We'll build on the rock. We'll build on the rock. We'll build on the rock, on the solid rock. On Christ, the mighty rock. Let's continue with showers of blessing, just the first stanza. Hymn number. Let's see. <laughs> showers of blessing is number 195. There shall be showers of blessing. This is a promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing. Sent from the Savior above, there shall be showers of blessings, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. Showers of blessings, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. Amen. At this time, we will have another special song, a song of meditation by uh, Sister Esther. Right after we pray first. That is correct. Sorry. Let us give thanks. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for what you have given to us. All that we have is yours. And now we pray, Father, help us to be faithful stewards. Help us to be faithful to you. And we pray that you may use these funds to the furtherance of your cause to bring souls into your kingdom is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath once again. So my next song will be It May Be at Morn. This is actually found in your hymnals, page 207, and you can feel free to sing along if you wish. When 
sunlight through a darkness and shadow is breaking that Jesus will come in the fullness of glory to receive from the world is all oh Lord Jesus how long, how long till we shout the glad song? Christ returneth, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, amen. It may be at midday, it may be at twilight it may be perchance that the blackness of midnight will burst into light in the blaze of his glory to receive from the Jesus, how long, how long till we shout the glad song? Christ returneth, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, amen. Oh, joy, oh, delight, should we go? without crying no sickness no sadness no dread and no crying caught up through the clouds with the Lord into glory to receive from the Thank you so much for that beautiful song. <clears throat> now let's continue with our songs of consecration and sing hymn number 177. Jesus, your blood and righteousness. My beauty are my glorious stress Mid flaming worlds in these Arrayed with joy Shall I lift up my head Bold shall I stand in that great day For by your cross of salt, I am from 
sin and guilt from fear and shame. Lord, I believe your precious blood, which at the mercy seat of God pleads for the captives with he was all so shed in love for me. When from the dust of death I rise to claim my mansion in the skies, this then shall be my own. Be please, Christ Jesus. Jesus lived and died for me. Amen. Let us sing day by day, 532. Day by day passing moment strength I find to meet my trials here trusting in my father's wise bestowment I've no cause for worry or for fear he whose heart is kind beyond all measure, gives unto each day what he deems best. Loving me, it's part of pain and pleasure, mingling toil with peace and rest. Every day, the Lord himself is near me with a spell, show mercy for each hour. All my cares he fain would bear and cheer me. He whose name is Counselor and Power, the Protector of his child and treasure is a charge that on himself he laid as your days your strength shall be in measure this the pledge to me he made help me then in every tribulation so to trust thy promises O oh Lord that I lose not faith sweet consolation offered me within thy holy word help me Lord when toil and trouble meeting, here to take as from a Father's hand. One by one, the days, the moments fleeting, till I reach the promised land. Please stand at this time for our hymn of meditation, hymn number 551, Jesus, Savior, Pilot Me, 551. Jesus, Savior, Pilot Me. Tempestuous sea, unknown ways before me roll, hiding rock and treacherous shoal, chart and compass. Call. 
come from Thee. Jesus, Savior, pilot me. As a mother stills her child, Thou canst hush the ocean wild. Boisterous waves obey Thy will. When Thou sayest to them be still, Wondrous sovereign of the sea, Jesus, Savior, pilot me. When at last I near the shore, and the fearful breakers roar, twist me and the peaceful rest. Then while leaning on thy breast, may I hear thee say to me, Fear not, 